Okay, thanks, Chris, and thanks, everybody. I can't um, see who's with us, so I have no idea of scale, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> um, and uh, I've only got the two screens and this very complex setup in front of me, so bear with me. I, I, I think it, it should work well. Um, so hi to everybody. Uh, my name is Marcus. For those of you that we haven't met before, uh, I've been chairing the QSIT committee with Ashley Miller for, for about five or six years as together, and prior to that, um, the FICE committee, and I was there when it all began. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about cardiac ultrasound and I'm going to talk as if you've never done it before because uh, there'll be a wide range of people in this um, audience um, but I'm going to take it really back to basics and really zoom in on the things that we can get out of it and the things we need to pay attention to. Um, I also appreciate that there'll be some people in the audience who, who perhaps have done quite a bit of this stuff uh, so bear with me but for those of you who have at the end we're going to touch on some of the the way that we can use this stuff for hemodynamic assessment. So I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, and, and these are the broad kind of categories of what we're going to talk about. First of all, in the first sort of half of this talk, and that is what is uh, focused echo, focused cardiac ultrasound? When should we use it? And that's indications. How we use it? And that's the technical how. And then the most important thing is why. And I'm going to show you all of the things that we should be able to pick up uh, in the emergency room and beyond uh, with focused cardiac ultrasound. So first of all, what? Well, it, it, as we know, POCUS is almost entirely, if not completely, 2D ultrasound that's moving images. Um, we look at the heart through different slices, which I'll talk about, um, and this being the parasternal long axis view. It's continuous moving imagery. We do very little measurements and we eventually can answer questions in a binary scale. So is there or isn't there things that are serious and usually things that are very significant. This is a parasitic long axis view and I've annotated here with different chambers we can see. Many of you will be familiar with this view. So we've got the left and right, I'm sorry, the left ventricle and the right ventricle separated by the interventricular septum. I don't know if you can see this little arrow here. Uh, and this is the interventricular septum in this view, and this is the posterior free wall. We've got valves, this is the mitral valve, and the long anterior leaflets, the short posterior leaflets, and uh, this is the aortic valve here, and the aortic root. But there are other things we can see. So this is the bright pericardium, as it runs behind the posterior free wall, and you, you might just be able to see a little echo free space in there, which inevitably um, contains a tiny bit of fluid. Here is the descending aorta in short axis, and as you know, the pericardial space kind of stops just above the descending aorta immediately in the in the sort of near field to that. And that's why we, we can really easily differentiate between pericardial fluid and pleural fluid, which is what we can see or what we would see in this space here, where we actually see instead just streaky lines which are all consistent with lung ultrasound. There is something else in here, though, that many of you might not have always seen, and it's something you see in the other views. Um, we'll talk about it as we go through. But that this in short axis is the coronary sinus. It's quite small, but sometimes you see it quite obviously and occasionally it's very large. And that would go with um, sometimes grown up congenital heart disease. But you'll definitely see this in the parasternal, sorry, the apical views as we're looking up. Um, and if you look too far down, and I'll show you what that means, you'll pick this up as it runs across the atrioventricular groove at the back of the heart. So if you're in a four chamber window and you see it, usually it's telling you to tilt up a bit. OK. The heart doesn't follow the axis of the body. The heart's in sort of obliquely across the chest in this kind of relationship, which is why nearly always the imaging has to be either towards the right shoulder or perhaps towards the left shoulder in, in the parasternal window. But to see the heart, we've got to see it through the ribs, through the lungs, and it's a wonder, frankly, that you can see it at all. There are there are four main windows that we talk about. Well, I say three windows and four big views. This is the parasternal long axis view up here on the top left. Here we go. The parasternal short axis view here on the top right. And then the apical four chamber, and then the subcostal four chamber, which looks rather similar, just over to its side. When do we do POCUS or focus cardiac ultrasound? And that really is any kind of cardiovascular or respiratory problem. Because one thing the heart and um, so cardiac echo can do is discriminate between 
a heart problem and a lung problem usually. So any hypotension, shock, chest pain, or dyspnea and hypoxemia will be a good indication for us to move in. And, and any uncertainty at all, um, usually colour culture sound can give us a lot more clarity on the problem. Certainly better than it would be with just my stethoscope in my hands. How? Well, we've got three big windows we've already mentioned. The parasternal window, the apical window, and the subcostal. So to start with, this is the parasternal long axis. You see all the structures here. You're probably familiar with, with this all already. But as you know, if you rotate uh, 90 degrees in any direction, you're going to go from a long axis to a short axis or vice versa. And many of you might or might not know that whatever's in the middle of this screen before we rotate will be the exact structure we look at in short axis. So for instance, if we were to look straight down at this point, we'd probably come through at the mid mitral level as you can see here in the lower screen. Now, I don't know if you're having some problems looking at that, so I'll just move it up here in case there's some things obstructing it because of the way this presentation is um, is presented by teams. But as you'll see here, there's that donut shape and then the mitral, uh, what we call sort of lovingly the fish mouth view, opening really nicely there. If you were to tilt the beam down a bit towards the mitral level, you'll see this view. This is the mid papillary level. And this is the, the papillary muscles as they're kind of attached into the inside of the, the ventricular wall. This is the go to view for looking at regional wall motion and, uh, and global contractility. But if we tilt the beam right up, that's now right up to the base of the heart. We see this wonderful view and, and this really is beautiful. I, I, I just spend time marveling it always when I see it, the beautiful trileaflet aortic valve, which I might be able to move it up for you to see it better. This is the interatrial septum, always attached to the non-coronary cusp, which is just here. This is the left atrium. This is the right atrium, the tricuspid valve, the right ventricular inflow and outflow. You might even see a pulmonary valve and the pulmonary arteries even breaking right and left. So much to see here, but none of it is useful, useful for POCUS. It's really an advanced echo view, but when you look at it, admire it, but move on back to the mid papillary view. The apical window is sometimes a bit trickier to get. It definitely takes some more practice. As you'll see here, there are these are four um, versions of it. The top left is the apical four chamber, and that's the view that we go for in uh, point of care ultrasound if we can. It gives fantastic imagery of the left and the right ventricles, and to compare them in terms of size and function. Um, obviously, if you tilt the beam anteriorly we'll pick up the LV outflow tract which we can see just over here this is what's lovely called the apical five chamber view for that reason picking up the LVAT and the aortic valve but there are two more and these are these are again a more advanced echo windows here on the first one you get to as you turn anti-clockwise from the apical four chamber here is this the apical two chamber and this is really important for um assessment ejection fraction in comprehensive echo but if you keep turning around about 120 degrees from the four chamber in an anti-clockwise direction, you get this one. This is the apical three chamber, or the Americans call it the long axis view. I'll come back to this because it's got really great alignment with the, L with the LVOT if you want to shoot Doppler across it. And then the subcostal window. This again, you'll be very familiar with through far extended fast scanning, um, I almost always use a phased array probe. I suspect you, some of you might use a, a curvilinear, but this is a view we, we, we will see. The subcostal view up here just looks like the four apical four chamber on its side. Obviously, if you rotate anti-clockwise, you'll, you'll meet the IVC if you're lucky, and this is the middle hepatic vein coming down. But if you just tilt the beam ever so slightly towards the midline, you'll pick up the aorta, and it's very easy to mistake the IVC for uh, the ALs are for the IBC. Notable differences are you'll see it just shooting straight off past the uh, right atrium. It doesn't enter it um, as compared to the to the one above, which clearly does. And then if you carry on sweeping the beam away from the sort of away from the patient's right shoulder down towards their left hip, just slowly, you'll go straight through all of the structures you see in the parasternal short axis window. I don't know if you if you see here, but in the lower left quadrant, this is the a mid papillary short axis view and sometimes a, a fantastic view to get all the things you can get when the other windows are difficult. Why? This is the most important bit. 
because uh, this is the stuff we're trying to pick up and differentiate. And sometimes they're not easy to do clinically. Um, so is, is the left ventricle dilated and or severely impaired? Is the right ventricle dilated and or severely impaired? And both of those are very difficult to, to detect clinically with any confidence. Are there features of low venous return? We used to talk about other features of hypovolemia, but we've realized that, that um, low venous return can be caused by hypovolemia or distributive shock, sepsis, for instance. There's a redistribution of fluid into the wrong space and it doesn't, it doesn't fill the heart as it should. They are indistinguishable on echo. You, you really only get this from clinical assessment, um, clinical history, actually, mainly. Is there a pericardial effusion? And is there a plural effusion? So those are the questions we set out to, to ask um, over 10 years ago with, with VICE that's now become Fusic Heart. And these are the features that the patients present with. In fact, these are the five characteristic abnormalities you see in a hemodynamic patient. OK, these are things that ECHO really pick up on. So left ventricular failure, right ventricular failure, which can coexist or um, exist in isolation, low preload, tamponade and valve disease and because patients don't come at you with big labels i'm just going to throw a case at you and often i would do this in an interactive way if you'll forgive me i, I, I find i'm going to find that probably a bit too difficult because i can't see you and um uh, so if you don't mind i'm just going to talk these things through so the first question is which one of these is this and i'll just move that to one side so you can see the image and i think the first thing my eyes see here is there's quite a big ventricle and um, it looks really wide. It's not really squeezing in uh, towards the middle of the ventricle. So if I put my eyes in the middle here, there's very, not very much change in the sort of shape and size of this chamber. And some of you will also have noticed that this mitral valve just isn't opening fully. It should really be whacking against the sternum here. So there's definitely something going on here with the left atrium. The right vent, vent, sorry, the, the left ventricle, I should say. The right, the right ventricle looks like it's performing not too badly, and the, the other bits and bobs don't look too bad at first glance. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is a problem with the left ventricle. So to share, I'm going to bring up on the top right. That's a normal image. I, I hope you can all see that clearly. The bottom left, we have uh, our patients, and as we'll see then, the whereas up here, the the, the ventricle here is shortening across the bottom, across the base, this dimension from diastole to systole shortened by more than a quarter and less than a half. OK, and that's what's called fractional shortening. And that's approximately the values that reflect normal LV function. It should be more than a quarter and not more than a half. OK, so if we have a look down here, this, um, sorry, down here now, this uh, this image here is shortening by much less than a quarter. In fact, it's probably not even 10%. And that means that certainly in this view, um, at the base of the heart, it suggests the heart is really severely impaired, okay? As we eyeball against the markers here, we can see that we can see, well, I, I think at least six centimeters in, in its um, dimension here, the end diastolic dimension of the left ventricle, as opposed to the one above, which is much, much less and we know that six centimetres, if you're over six centimetres, even in a man, you're clearly dilated. It's quite significantly dilated. So you try to remember a number, six centimetres is the one to remember. But remember that perhaps at the high fives, you know, particularly in women, that's already abnormal. The other thing about this is when, when I first look at this, I, I sort of think the other chambers don't look too bad. But then I remember that there's a, we call it lovingly the rule of thirds or the rule of three where if I draw a line from the apex of these of the sector all the way through the heart here, through the, sorry, the aortic root, then across the left atrial diameter in this line, then they should all be about the same proportion. So the right ventricular outflow tract in the near field, the aortic root and the left atrial diameter are all about the same size. When we look back at the other view, we can see that that is clearly not the case. In fact, the left atrium now suddenly looks a lot larger than I originally thought. And that's one of the things about eyeballing that um, can be misleading. When all the chambers are large, your brain can sort of trick you to think they're OK. And in fact, when I look at the right ventricular outflow tract, that doesn't look quite as normal as I thought it was. 
Um, now, the, the, the thing is, you'll see these two um, windows here. The top right one is the, the perfect um, parastellar log axis window lying nice and flat across the screen. Can you see that? This one is much more uh, oblique. It's, it's much more at an angle. And that's because I was taking this image from a low parastellar long axis view. There are several views on the chess wall. If the lower ones are easier to get, so in an emergency, you're much more likely to have your heart in this angle up at 45 degrees rather than lying flat along here, which is the go to view. This one will be at least one or maybe even two rib spaces higher than the, the, than the patient's one on the bottom left. So if you're struggling with a very oblique view, just try to go up a rib space. Ask the patient to turn on the left hand side if they can take a breath in and then breathe out slowly and that should bring the heart through into view so that you can record that window at the top right of the screen. OK, so this person was 24. She was having a baby in the hospital I was working at and, one, and during her first stage of labour, she got to about four or five centimetres and, uh, and then became heavily oxygen dependent. And one of my colleagues in obstetric anesthesia said, you must come and have a look because I'm pretty sure she's had a pee. Can you come and have a look at her? We're a bit worried. And I came along and I was looking at this image and I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. This was clearly over six centimetres in width. It wasn't contracting properly. This is the kind of heart I see in old people. And yet this woman was 24 and looked yeah. as healthy as anyone I could, I could see. And, and contextually as well, the last thing we were thinking about was this dilated cardiomyopathy, in this case, peripartum. I mean, it, it's a known diagnosis. And yes, you know, we know that we'll bump into patients like this eventually. But, but uh, at the point of care, I wasn't thinking about this at all. And actually, it took me two or three minutes to accept what my eyes were seeing because I just couldn't quite put it all together. So this person has severely impaired LV function. You can see this is the dilated, poorly contractile, globally impaired left ventricle. This is again just showing you normal at the top right. And uh, if you look at this, this is that wonderful view I was telling you about here, all the structures we've already mentioned. But the reason I'm showing you this is here. This is her interatrial septum and, and it should be like wobbling around all through the cycle. It just sort of wiggles around during the cycle in health. But in disease like this, when there's it's bowed continuously from the left side to the right side, this is fixed atrial bowing. That is this young lady has high left atrial pressure without doubt. She also had lots of lung ultrasound signs of primary edema. This woman had acute on chronic raised left atrial pressure and was now in primary edema. OK, so that is a view that can help uh, add to your um, diagnosis. And here you'll see the four chamber window. Actually, the RV doesn't look as big as we may have thought. OK. There are other kinds of cardiomyopathy. And here is one. It's probably the most important. Um, this is a different patient, a parasternal long axis view. Again, a bit of a low view because it's up at 45 degrees again. But as you'll see, the heart's thickening really well here. It's a posterior free wall. The base is thickening really well, but the midsection down to the apex is doing nothing. If I was to show you what normal looks like, you won't be surprised there. And, uh, and so there's something very abnormal about that regional wall motion. And if you look at it again, this is the parasonal short axis view. Again, such a fantastic view. And what we'll see here is that there is a whole section of that that's not working. Now, pretty easy to spot. OK, most of us here would get it. But I must say that the more subtle these things get, the harder they are to spot. And it will be you're not expected to be able to pick these things up. OK, something that really comes with advanced echo experience and, and a lot of time spent with a machine. But as you progress, you will be able to pick these things up more and more subtly. And, um, and this this one here is in the classic territory of the left anterior descending, the LAD. So it's the anterior septum of the heart plus the uh, anterior wall uh, in this view. And then again, if we were to look in a, a, a four chamber window, it would be the, the mid to distal interventricular septum and the apex of the heart. OK, so that's the LAD territory. And here you can see it pretty clearly. Just for interest's sake, uh, you'll know that cardiologists may have, have divided the heart up in, or the left ventricle into these segments. You don't have to remember what they are. Uh, just remember that there are 17 of them, one being the apical cap, and it's rotated like this. So if we were looking at this image, you'll see that the anterior septum and the anterior wall are akinetic. 
and that's classical of LAD territory ischemia. Uh, and you will see this um, frequently, particularly in the patients that are coming uh, to intensive care. This is the most frequent um, injury I see. And sometimes you'll be the first person to think of it because of what you've seen on, on ultrasound. Okay, doesn't guarantee that this is all completely acute. That's clinical assessment as well. But it certainly gets the attention of cardiologists when they're trying to get them to take the patients to the cath lab. Talking of cath lab, this is another patient. This person has also got the characteristic signs of uh, acute LAD infarction, you, but you'll also see this swirling um, spontane spontaneous echo contrast. This is a terrible thing to see in any person's heart, particularly on the left side. So you shouldn't see this. This is slow flow. This person's got serious ischemic um, cardiogenic failure, and this person was in already in my ICU with everything going. Okay. So spontaneous echo contrast is bad. But there are other kinds of cardiomyopathies, and I see these quite frequently, particularly in my world, because I'm, I'm, I'm in, in the ICU with patients who are super sick. And, um, and this, I don't know if you can see, this is our uh, a patient, again, another parasite along. Similar thing here with just the base of the heart moving uh, and a bit, a bit of movement here at the base of the septum. But then you'll see nothing going on here from the mid and nothing here on the midsection here either. And I'll just... You compare that to the, to the normal, you'll, you'll, I think you'll agree with me. But this is the stress cardiomyopathy or, or Takotsubo as it's sometimes referred to. And the, the characteristic thing about this is actually if you look at the base of the heart, which I'm doing here, most of it is moving. I mean, it's not too bad. But if you move down just a fraction, you'll tilt in short axis down to the mid papillary section, you'll see there's nearly nothing, nothing happening. There's no fractional error change. There's just... The heart's moving around, but it's being pulled by the basal territories. None of that is actually contracting at all. And that goes right down to the base. This is a bit of a zoomed in five chamber window, but you get the idea. But the important thing about this and the reason that this is not a regional wall motion that needs the cath lab immediately or not in terms of um, treatment wise is because this goes beyond the, the LAD territory. This is LAD territory from here, the midsection round to the apex. But what you'll see here is that the lateral wall is down and that's not working. Only the base of it here is, is trying to trying to um, pull the whole heart along. So this is, it traverses coronary territories. It's obvious to see with focused cardiac ultrasound. This is stress cardiomyopathy. And the reason this is important is that you, um, you mustn't do the same things that you do for uh, normal ischemic cardiomyopathy. You know, certainly patients, if they come to ICU and they're got cardiogenic shock, we're typically trying to fill them up with, with ionotropic support and, and, and something, those drugs drive heart rate up. And that's the problem for these people. They're actually, what they really need is beta blockade. In fact, you need to stop those beta agonists. You need to slow that heart down and you need to reduce that sympathetic stimulation because that, that is the problem in Takasubo or stress cardiomyopathy. Uh, something quite brave to do when you've got someone with gross pulmonary edema on CPAP and, you know, you're just about to wind, wind up the inotropes. OK, case two. Um, again, I'm hope, just bear with me. I'm going to point out the obvious abnormalities. But the first thing I notice when I see this is a really big left atrium. OK, that thing is huge. It's several times bigger than the aortic root. The, the rule of threes is completely broken. So the left atrial diameter is huge. And I think the RV is also much bigger than it should. So always look at the aortic root. It's nearly always between two and three centimeters, very rarely more, never less. It helps you to measure things or eyeball things against it, okay? The other thing I look at is the left ventricle. It's sort of, it's very um, hyperdynamic. It seems to be contracting quite a lot. Remember I told you that this dimension here should shorten by no more than a, well, by more than a quarter and no more than a half, okay? I think this is shortening by more than a half. So this is a hyperdynamic ventricle. Now that's that's an odd com com uh, combination to have in large chambers, but a hyperdynamic LV. And then I look and go, oh, hang on a second, this 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 mitral valve just doesn't look right. It's really bright, it's really thickened. And if you um if, so so if we were going to kind of zoom in on a problem here, I'm I'm going in for something. There's something wrong with this valve. And, then, and I think there's also consequently a problem with the right ventricle. So let's let's drill into uh, compared to normal. You'll all be familiar with that lovely anterior leaflet of the mitral valve opening fully, nice and straight, almost banging against the interventricular septum, as you can see up here in the uh, top right field. 
compare now to this one here and it's just not moving properly it's poking downwards at the end can you see that just at the end of diastole in what's called the hockey stick deformity it's supposed to describe the, the, the sort of the shape of that tip pointing down um, and as you you might just see if I move this out of the way you might just see that there's a continuous black space between the, the valve leaflets so although it seems to close I don't know if you can see that but it doesn't close completely okay so we can really guess now that there's there's almost certainly a degree of stenosis of the mitral valve and also the, the high likelihood of regurgitation as well causing raised left atrial pressure and then back pressure up to the right heart causing uh, right ventricular failure and this is what if you put color doctor on i mean i think we can all agree that's a huge amount of abnormal flow both in and out of the left ventricle back into the left atrium so that's um mixed mitral valve disease this um this is the uh, parasomal short axis views uh, so the one on the bottom left is the patient and you'll see um can you see how on the right we've got all the, the the gaps between the two valves that's known as the commissures are wide open in that lovely fish mouth shape whereas here the corners of the mouth are pinched together and fused this is um rheumatic heart disease absolutely classic rheumatic mitral valve disease and there it is in the in the four chamber view this person was also in her mid 20s, also Caucasian and also having a baby in my hospital. She went to theatre. Um, she had three screens of asystole for her elective section, her third, and got the attention of the anaesthetist. She came into recovery, uh, at which point she had a postpartum hemorrhage, only about five or six hundred mils, but it was enough to cause massive hemodynamic collapse. She went up onto loads of oxygen. She went grey around the edges. Her blood pressure was nearly unrecordable at some point, And I thought we were going to lose her. And I was called in again. Oh, can you come and look? She must have had a PE. And obviously, you know, not. This woman had acute rheumatic heart disease. This is something I was told in medical school I, I would never see. I, you know, I'm afraid they said, oh, these days are gone. You'll need to ask the old people because they might have had it. Um, you really only see this in other countries now. But this woman was a traveller. And she, had, she was a tough lady. She didn't make a fuss. She was breathless right through her pregnancy. Uh, she just thought it was her asthma and she kept on pumping her inhalers. And I think she had an indeterminate VQ scan at some point, so ended up on some heparin. But the woman had severe mitral valve disease and I'm happy to say went on to have replacement and hopefully um, possibly even more children, who knows. But I hope, I hope she's gone on to have a successful and healthy life. This is um, mitral valve disease. We don't have time to talk about aortic valve disease, if you'll forgive me, but valve disease can be pretty obvious. And actually, um, Bob Jarman, who always talks about normology and learning what normal looks like and, and seeing enough normal to know that something's abnormal, I think that says a lot up to about the aortic valve. Um, I just don't have time to, 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 to dwell on that. Here is a patient who came out of the cath lab one day and subsequently had an elective angiography and then collapsed in the hours to follow. This isn't my image, but this is a snapshot of the screen of the image. And uh, I have seen a patient just like this with, with these kind of numbers, a horribly low blood pressure, very high CBP. There's almost no flow around this person's circulation whatsoever. Uh, there's pulses paradoxus. I don't know if you can see that here with the breathing, the pressure going up and down. This person's at close to arrest. And um, the cardiologists weren't too interested in it. Uh, I said, oh, she's OK, she's got pneumonia, forget about it. And it took this not very good image to convince them otherwise. And I put this here because it's real world, it's overgained, it's all done in the height of emotion and um, collapse. But I think if you help, if you let me go through bit by bit, that I think that's a valve. That's got to be the mitral valve here in this snowstorm, which makes this the left ventricle. This must be the interventricular septum. And therefore, that is the RV free wall. This is a tiny little sliver of a right ventricle, and this would be the tricuspid valve in the right atrium. And of course, this thing is a significant collection of blood that's accumulated very quickly and it's causing cardiac tamponade. So uh, the, the magical thing, well, this lady clearly has tamponade. I'm sure you would have all agreed with that. Um, and uh, this is just another view of a collapsing right ventricle. Um, and I, I must say that the right atrial pressure is lowest as the ventricle collapses because what happens is it, sh it pulls it down away from the, the, um, the vascular structures and it sucks the pressure down so you should see 
uh, right atrial systolic collapse, and that's ventricular systole. And then as pressure goes up in the pericardium, it's right ventricular diastolic collapse, which you can see here. And the magical thing is one drain, maybe even five mils of, of blood out, and you see a wonderful change in the numbers. And I, I, I don't know if any of you have been, have been through this experience, but I don't think I've ever seen anything quite as dramatic, both on the way towards dying and then coming right back out of it in, in about a nanosecond with just a tiny bit of blood. Here's another image of a big pericardial effusion with systolic collapse of the right atrium and diastolic collapse of the right ventricle. And if you're not sure, advanced echo can give you a few more tools. And this is a pulse wave Doppler, which is looking at the velocity of blood in a certain segment in this um, what we call sampling volume just here. And of course, we can see that that changes um, from, from beat to beat. And that if it's spontaneous breathing and it's more than 25 percent, it in, indicates the possibility of um, of tamponade. But this again, once you're up into this level of territory, you really um, you should be doing this alongside cardiology. Um, because they're the people that are, you know, going to be this, the, the, the right people to involve at this point. There are smaller fusions, and this is an example of one that's not causing tamponade. The RV is filling quite nicely, uh, so are all the other chambers. So, and these are common when you go looking in sick people. Um, my general message would be to wherever you see a sick person with hemodynamic problems and you identify a pericardial effusion, just telegraph that to cardiology day or night um, because it's, it's up to them to come and tell you that that is OK, not the other way around. And that's, that would be my suggestion to all of you because people have got into hot water um, uh, in, in this regard. Case four, uh, this is a horrible patient, oh, sorry, horrible patient, a horrible condition to have. Um, we've got, uh, of these, you can clearly see the right ventricle not contracting properly. And, and there's also what's interesting is left ventricular problems as well. So this right ventricle dominant is dominant in size. But if you notice the small vent left ventricle here, but the, the two walls of the left ventricle are moving at the same time in the same direction. OK, can you see that? So the, the, the septum tends to go towards the biggest mass. So when the right ventricle is the biggest, it will move in that direction. But consequently, it unloads the left ventricular function. So it's crammed into a corner um, because of ventricular interdependence. And then the, the ventricle, the, the septum departs from normal function, further compromising the left. And this is a, a normal here on the top right, which you're familiar with. Um, so this person's got horrible right ventricular failure and, and in a ventricular interdependence, which you can see here in the subcostal and now in a short axis window. This is the classical D-shaped of uh, ventricular um, interdependence, and it's a really serious problem. And, and what I would say is that these patients, if you're looking for something like stroke volume variation to guide your hemodynamic um, uh, management, they have strong false positive results. So if you're using a cardiac output monitor and you watch stroke volume variation or pulse pressure variation, all of it is is factitious and it would convince you potentially to give more fluid which would kill someone like this so this is where your skills even the most simple um, and, and inexperienced people in this group will be able to pick this up and and really that's a life-saving uh, bedside diagnosis in my view because it allows people to get in and do the right things or perhaps stop doing the wrong things okay so this is a dilated congested right um sorry ivc which you'd expect to see I'm afraid this is a person who's now on life's limits. These are, this is the same kind of patient, but with, with even more um, compression of the left ventricle. And unfortunately, this view again, as I'm afraid this is indeed a parasitic long axis uh, with spontaneous echo contrast in all chambers. I'm afraid this is a perimortem um, echo finding. I hope you never, ever see this. The last touch is to say that you do sometimes see free free clot in the right atrium. Many of you will have seen stuff like this already and um, had the difficult decision or perhaps easy decision to thrombolize. This was another another obstetric case. Uh, a colleague of mine put to sleep having just done a manual evacuation in theatre. I don't know why they did that. And she um, collapsed and became very oxygen dependent in the process. She put her to sleep because um, it felt like that was the right thing to do, stabilized her. And I did a whole um, study thinking it was all looking rather normal. And, and I just last minute because the baby had just come out, I said, oh, I'll just have a quick look in the subcostal window. No one would have seen that for, for a few months. And bang, there it is. This is a huge piece of clot and it goes all the way back to the renal vein. And um, we, the interesting thing about this patient was we didn't wake her up. 
We spoke about her with um, our ECMO team in London. They scrambled their team, they came out, they put the pipes in, they didn't connect her up to ECMO, but they took her back and then they woke her up on their unit with the ability to give her ECMO if she crashed. And this, um, they decided not to thrombolize because they thought that might break away. And if it broke away, it would have obstructed the whole pulmonary circulation. It was so big. And I'm happy to say she got better with, um, with just simple anticoagulation, thank goodness, and a rather dramatic um, relocation to St Thomas's. The final case, um, uh, this is uh, 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 lung fields you'd never really want to see. There's clearly some infiltrates there. Got, I mean, most people look at that and think, my goodness, this is a pulmonary edema. Um, and you might have even started some um, diuretic therapy based on that. But when you look with echo, quite often you find the absolute opposite of what you think. So perhaps we'd all imagine this person would have had heart failure, but actually what we're seeing here is a small hyperdynamic ventricle. This is clearly low preload. And, and the question is, is this hypovolemia or is this sepsis? You just can't tell, okay? You just can't tell. Both of them give you a, a poor venous return or reduced venous return for different reasons, but um, in sepsis it's pulled in the splanchnic veins and the sort of capacitance vessels, and it, not much of it's coming back to the heart. Um, in hypovolemia, obviously, there's not enough stress volume, so the, the end result is the same. The heart is not filled properly. And here's an example on the bottom left of another heart that's very, very small in end diastole and in end systole. And you'll have heard the expression kissing the period muscles. It's very emotive, but there you go. That's what that looks like. And um, and here it is in a parasternal short axis. And you'll, you'll see all in, in hypovolemia, all the chambers are small and your IVC will be small as well. OK, so the fundamental thing is if the heart's underfilled, every chamber will be small. Now, not every small chamber is underfilled. This is a patient with, um, I don't know if you can see this, but very hypertrophic left ventricle. You see those walls? They're really thick. Interventric conception and posterior free wall. And they're moving in. They're tiny. That This person has treacherously difficult um, hemodynamic management because they have to have high filling pressure to be able to distend their ventricle to, to get forward flow. But they very easily get overloaded and run into pulmonary edema. So very difficult um, cases to look after. And here, here's another one with um, in the subcostal window. If you're interested in um, stuff, just quick revision sheets, I uh, recommend here the um, criticalcarenorthampton.com website. And I'll give you a little um, QR code at the end just to help uh, to get you there. Uh, there are lots of these kind of things made mostly by Johnny uh, Wilkinson, a great friend of mine, and Ashley Miller, and I have contributed to a few over the years. And I'm going to move on now for the next 20 minutes, if, if I may, just to start talking about um, more sort of integrative stuff. How do we how do we use this? And, you know, we've talked about the five different sort of hemodynamic patterns, but now how can we utilise it to, to the benefit of patients? And I, and I love this slide because it shows three different patients. Let's call them A, B and C. They're all very different and you can see very easily that there's, there are different sizes. The yellow lines there are supposed to, to show how they're, um, they're um, uh, uniformly presented to you. Patient on the right, you've seen already grossly dilated, um, poorly contractile patient with dilated cardiomyopathy. The patient on the left is hyperdynamic and small. Uh, trying their best to eject blood with what, whatever preload they've got. And the one in the middle could be, well, is actually looking like it's probably OK. In fact, it's a, a normal looking echo. But each of these patients will be potentially generating the same cardiac output, the same blood pressure, possibly similar looking physiology for the end of the bed. And, um, and they are very difficult to distinguish. Here is a QR code. If you've got the ability, do just scan this. It'll take you to a paper that um, was probably a real life paper. It's paper like people like me and outreach going around a hospital with sick patients and trying to identify which of them had an abnormal low or high ejection fraction. And the amazing thing was they got them all wrong. They had a zero sensitivity for picking out abnormal um, ejection fraction like this and they used a, a, a cardiac output monitor to do it and I think that tells the story really that we're not as good as we think we are and um, patients don't behave as they should in textbooks. 
It's just something about ejection fraction because a, a lot of uh, excitement is there. Uh, people try uh, talk about it in quantifiable terms, uh, and and we absolutely mustn't do that. Okay, if you're an echo expert. You do get good at um, calibrating your eyes to um, to five percent ranges, and that means something to cardiologists who are tracking things over many many months and years. But for us, it really isn't. As you know, we're looking for either something really normal or very abnormal and the shades of grey in between are not good but just to go in on our left ventricular ejection fraction we know it's got something to do with stroke volume because that's part of the equation um, and we know it's got something to do with sort of systolic performance of the ventricle and so that's true those and if ideally if it was just the perfect thing and it only spoke to contractility it would be great the problem is that it's got so many other inputs so um, to interpret ejection fraction and to equate it with stroke volume, you need to know left ventricular size. So, um, for instance, the, the, the heart you saw on the left, the small underfilled hearts, that is um, probably ejecting the same stroke volume, but clearly um, almost all of the systolic um, performance is ejecting almost everything that's in the heart because it's so small as compared to the other heart, which is grossly enlarged with a poor ejection fraction, but was probably eliminating the same blood. But the really big thing is that the preload, the amount of volume coming back into the heart massively affects this whole thing. So if your preload is low, you'll have high ejection fraction and, and the opposite is, is often true. But not just the, how much the blood is returning to the heart, but also the pressure against which the heart is working. So you can turn up noradrenaline and keep going up and up and up until eventually the heart is not able to squeeze anymore. And this is a problem that we see with um, when you're loading patients who've got heart failure or stress cardiomyopathy, um, you can elevate their blood pressure, but you'll start reducing their cardiac output. So afterload has a really big part to play. The opposite is also true, by the way. So if, you, if someone has a normal heart, but they have septic shock, they have a low afterload. So the ventricle is able to contract more than it normally should, which is why you have such a high bounding pulse, high cardiac output um, state. And, and probably that's an evolutionary thing. I don't know. But um, it's to do with that vasoplegia, low afterload uh, state. Another a thing that happens quite a lot in the ICU is that um, techs come in, they look at their heart, it looks normal to them, and they write in their report normal LV function because the ejection fraction is normal. But they don't know that the patient's on loads of drugs trying to make the heart work hard. So if, if you're just achieving normal in the face of inotropic support, it's clearly abnormal. And, and that's partly why um, cardiac um, ultrasound has, has grown so much in, in, in our specialty, it's, as in yours, because it's the power of a clinician who really understands the nuances here of doing the ultrasound themselves and interpreting it and, and interpreting it in the clinical context. So um, I don't remember that uh, patient with the mitral, mixed mitral valve disease. We saw that the valve didn't close properly and there was all that MR. I knew that because the, the ventricle was hyperdynamic but I could see it was looking abnormally contractile and that can only mean either there's maybe some gross septic shock and, and but, but clinically that was not the case it was all because blood was going out the back door and back into the, the left atrium so clinical context clinical history is absolutely key particularly when you're trying to differentiate between vasoplegia and hypovolemia I mentioned preload. I, I, I like this. I looked it up one day and I found out it's uh, number two I just drink alcohol, especially in large quantities before going out socially. That's not the kind of preload I'm talking about. I'm talking about filling of the heart. It's, um, it's a mixture of or you can define it into pressure and volume terms, but really it's how much of the wall is stretched. So it's, it talks to the kind of starling um, curve and the, the sort of preload dependence of the heart. Now, this is how I approach um, giving volume to sick patients. And these are the three things I, I think or do. So just showing you my approach. But the first question is always, do I think fluids might help this person? Do I think they could have low preload? And in undifferentiated shock, there's always that possibility because you don't know the full story. Patients aren't able to always give big, you know, beautiful histories. But I search for, for fluid losses, bleeding, and an infection and I try and think well, okay well maybe a little bit of fluid would be a good idea let's try but the next thing I do is use ultrasound to look for volume tolerance and this is the, the a kind of expression that's really moving into POCUS uh, very very quickly and it's about how much 
how harm can I do to them by giving them volume? OK, you don't necessarily need echo to know that you might get a chest X-ray. Um, one of the frustrations I think I find with some of my physician colleagues is they do an X-ray. It looks a little bit like palm edema and then they won't give any volume at all, even when it's clearly the right thing to do. So you know, we all have our tools. But for me, I use echo and you've seen all of those things already. You've seen left ventricular failure. You've seen right ventricular failure. Neither of those will tolerate extra volume very well, although it's not not absolutely impossible. They might benefit, but um, patients who have low volume tolerance because of the, the POCAS assessment, um, they're the people that I now want to go in and look at for responsiveness. OK, so those are the people I say, right, OK, I want to give them some fluid. I know that I might cause them harm. I now need to, to, to look at really good endpoints as to whether or not there is an, indeed a translation to improve forward flow. And I'm looking like a hawk for the signs of, 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 of injury or complications. And um, so typically these are the people that need to come into ICU. And I think there's a real change. I think the people I work around um, uh, and, and talk to, there's a, there's a real open, a more open mindedness now, I think, to patients who've got sepsis, who are not hypovolemic, who you can give fluid to and they will improve momentarily for a few minutes. Uh, but ultimately, you're going to keep pushing fluids. You're going to push them into edema and now worsening organ function because of, of venous congestion and, and, and poor perfusion. So I think the whole give two litres and then call ICU, I think that's moving on to like give 500 mils, maybe a litre. And if they, if they haven't improved very clearly, they weren't hypovolemic in the first place. Actually, if their low blood pressure is there, it may be they need vasopressors. So going back to this patient here, if you don't know which one of those patients you've got, and you give patient A the treatment for patient C, and um, patient C the treatment for patient A, you will kill them. I mean, it's as simple as that, or you could do. If you give treatment for A or C to patient B, it probably, it'll probably just about cope. But the point is, we get away with a lot of this stuff because we don't look and because we don't know. So I think in the modern world, we, we really need to be looking before we act. This is stuff you know already. You know, if you're hypovolemic, you need fluids. You probably don't need vasopressors. That will buy you a bit of blood pressure, but it will reduce your cardiac output and potentially run you into harm. You definitely don't want to be hypodynamic because you might end up with some other problems. For instance, I haven't got time to talk about it, but systolic anterior motion and outflow tract obstruction, that can really happen with patients who are hypovolemic and, and sympathetically driven, um, so that's not good. If you're vasoplegic, you don't need fluids because fluids just going to leak out into the tissues and contribute to harm. You, what you really need is vasopressors. And you definitely, again, don't want to have inotropes. You're already hyperdynamic. You don't want beta agonism in vasodilated people. If you've got a heart that doesn't work, you probably don't need fluids. In fact, probably that's the harm, if, especially if you've got a completely overloaded biventricular state. Uh, you, if you give vasopressors to people with heart failure, that might my, my patient C you're going to really cause them harm because they just won't be able to cope against the afterload and their cardiac output will drop like a stone. What you need is inotropes. So these, these are really powerful treatments. You need to know what we're giving at any time. Now, you know, I've, I mentioned that in um, sepsis we have, um, we give volume and the volume can disappear very quickly. You'd be lucky to have any intravascular volume addition after 30 minutes. And if it's sepsis, it's probably more like five. So, um, we need to be rational about what we're doing. You can look at the arterial line and there are definitely um, uh, machines that can do this for you. Or you can even eyeball the arterial line if you want. That gives you something. So arterial access is good. And there are non-invasive cardiac output monitors and give you a whole lot more information, as I um, mentioned in that study that you have the QR code for. But this isn't available in every ward. It's probably it's certainly not in every um, emergency department, not the ones I've worked in. So, so the first question really I think to ask is you have a person who's ill you think they might need some fluid you now know um, that they've got some uh, tolerance issues perhaps you think that you need to go forwards now we need to know is that straight volume low because we know we can't pick it out in um, uh, our cells clinically I want you to imagine this is a volume of blood leaving the heart and we've got a surface area of that um, bolus of blood as it shoots out and we've got a distance that, that bolus of blood travels and if you know those two dimensions you can work out the volume which is the basis 
of um, cardiac output monitoring using echo. So you remember pi, uh, pi r squared, or if actually if it's pi times two times diameter squared, although um, anyway, don't worry about it. <laughs> Basically, pi r squared. Uh, the the diameter we're looking at is the LVAT, right? That's this bit here, um, and it's the, the the dimensions from here across. Uh, now to do this, um, I'm going to show you this just animation from Ashley here. You get a parasternal long axis view. You zoom in on the LV outflow tract. You freeze it in mid systole, and then you get you get your calipers and you measure as close as you can to the AV analyst. The aortic valves there. I don't know if you can see. They have a hinge point here, and that's where you want to measure it. It's just right at the hinge point there, with that line across. Okay, measuring the um, LVOT diameter is difficult, right? It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and especially when you are now including this dimension, if you make a 10% abnormality in the measurement, um, you've seen this slide already, you will, that measurement abnormality, will, or the error will be squared. So it really does have a big, big impact on the overall number. So if you're going to quantify it, do it very carefully. Or ignore the diameter altogether and just use this, because this is the next stage of the, the, the puzzle. We're looking at the distance that blood travels using pulse wave Doppler close to the aortic valve annulus. I think you can see that there. This is the sampling volume. We'll see um, that that gives us a trace, as you can see here on the right hand side. It's got a characteristically black inner circle because it's looking at laminar flow at a certain point, only measuring one set of velocities, which are these ones. And this is measured over time. So as blood ejects, it ejects to a peak velocity and then it comes down again. So, so just so sorry, just to clarify, to get this um, trace, we want to be in an apical five chamber window, which is apical four tilted upwards, and you hit pulse wave Doppler, and then you hit it one more time, and it will give us that trace. It says here the normal VTI values are 18 to 22. You've seen this already. You've seen these two views that I mentioned as advanced windows, but you'll see there the apical three chamber on the bottom right here. This is the uh, another view you can get. Good alignment with Doppler. And this is what it looks like. You might even see there there's this little like spiky thing, this little spike coming down here. So you get the trace coming through and then there's spike and there's another one here, trace and a spike. And another one here, trace and a spike. That's the closing snap. It's basically the sound of the ventricle of the aortic valve shutting, and um, you need to see that in order to get the right um, trace. And I don't know if you remember this from school. This is um, distance equals speed times time. Well, if you know something speed and you know the time it takes, and that's effectively what we've got here in this this thing. That's speed times time. The area under that curve will be distance okay so it's basically the distance traveled by by one bolus of blood as it passes through the aortic valve so now we know the diameter and the cross-sectional area and we also know the distance traveled so that way we can end up with stroke volume okay so that's cross-sectional area times vti cardiac output would be that value times heart rate so it's stroke volume times heart rate so that's how the machine can help you to, do, um, to, to generate cardiac output. But interestingly, as I said, you know, measuring LVOT diameter is difficult. It introduces error. And actually, there's a concept that we're just catching on. I love POCUS for this because it breaks all the rules. Um, it may be it's better to forget LVOT diameter and just look at the VTI times the heart rate. And that's something called uh, minute distance. And maybe that will be something that we're all going to be able to do because you can, if you look at minute distance, um, multiply it together and then do an intervention and look at what happens afterwards that will be quite powerful and it and negates all of the complexity of quantifying for straight uh, for, for straight volume and cardiac output. So just to remind you what's normal VTI of 18 or less is is too small and when people are really sick it can be in single figures and it's, it's frightening to see people that sick. Um, when people are hyperdynamic it will be much more than 22 Stroke volume is the range you can see here and cardiac output the range you see here. So if you worried about 
tolerance, you're ready to give a volume challenge, we must look at volume responsiveness, okay? And this is the next question we, we ask in Physic HD. Is question number two is, is the stroke volume responsive to fluids most likely, but also the other treatments? And I'm just going to whiz through this. There, you can predict it. Um, if you're interested, there's Ashley's paper to look at, which will, um, it's getting on to be a bit old now. It's five or six years old, but it tells, tells you a bit more detail about this stuff. I'm actually going to leave this slide because I think it would just um, make life a bit more confusing and it's um, we haven't got time to discuss that. But I really do want you to scan this QR code um, because it, it gives a lovely talk by Ashley. It's only 20 minutes, um, but it will give you a really good understanding of how hemodynamics works and how important venous return is in that process. So please, would you please scan it, log it, read it later because it is um, is gold dust. And this is the stuff. We're really smashing some of the old beliefs around fluids um, and how to manage patients like this. And I think I really think this is a great start. So please, please scan it and, um, and listen. In the last few minutes, um, just to say this is a diagram that describes this is imagine a mechanically ventilated patients where the airway pressure goes up for inspiration and down again for expiration. What happens is the blood in the left ventricle gets pushed into into the heart, sorry, into the lungs, gets pushed into the left ventricle and stroke volume, or oh, this one here, goes up. Actually, also let's say this is pressure, arterial pressure goes up and up and up. And then when the pressure drops in the, the mechanical ventilator, you get a drop in that pressure, okay? And what we can see, you might, this is saying velocity time integral, but that's correl correlates with stroke volume. You can see that going up and up and up as blood's pushed into the left ventricle. But at the same time, blood is prevented from coming through into the right. And so when the pressure is released, you get the opposite effect. There's a tidal ebb where there's not enough flow, flow coming into the heart and the ventricle drops again. So this cyclical up and down is what we see in pulses paradoxus, um, with tamponade, for instance. But we also see it in mechanical ventilation where uh, there's preload dependence. And you, you've seen here that I don't know if you can see that the, the peak velocities of these things uh, it is, goes up and down here. There's, there's a difference between them, okay? So we can see this in um, intensive care patients on ventilators. I appreciate it's not quite so easy for you to see in the in the emergency department. But what I would say is that there are lots of confounders to this. You, you need to have decent tidal volumes, slow heart rhythms, so we can see the difference, an intact thorax, uh, it has to be mechanically ventilated, invasive ventilation, no spontaneous breathing, and no heart failure and other confounders. And that, that, that means they're quite rare, even in the ICU. Probably see this in, in the operating theatre, these conditions. So using VTI variation has limitations in the real world. Another way to do it, we, you may have heard that the IVC can be measured, uh, the distensibility in a ventilated patient can be measured and calculated in a small equation. But these are two very small studies I don't know about you, but I don't know anyone who uses this to predict uh, volume re um, responsiveness. I think the IVC is a lovely thing to look at. It's really helpful if it's really, really small and collapsing or if it's completely distended and, 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 and not um, in any way dynamic. But really, that's just telling us the same that we always knew about CVP and we stopped using CVP for volume status ages ago. So. You've seen this graph briefly, this slide, but I'm just bringing you again to this, um, uh, the IVC, you've seen uh, this is how, so as your pressure goes up, the IVC distends if you're in preload dependence, and the opposite is true. Don't worry about the SVC, that's um, that's a bit, bit more um, complicated than these TOE. This is actually quite a useful thing, and this is what I want you to, le to leave with, but this is um, a, a passive leg raise. So patients um, got about 300 mils of blood in their venous volume usually. If you tilt them head down, legs up, that enters the heart, enters the central circulation, and you should see a change in your um, uh, VTI volume, or velocity time integral um, that will reverse when you get back down. And uh, this just happens to be a machine some of you may use. Um, you'll notice the master recorded this a couple of years ago, but it's just to show that you can pick up an apical four chamber window, and if you engage this profile in the G uh, venue machines, it will track, it will go, it's an auto VTI function, it will go straight to the L LV outflow tract, it will find the right image and as you can see display it there for you and of course you can then use that to do a passive leg raise and um, and hopefully see some 
some changes that might be useful to you. So you can predict food response to this or you can measure it. And this is the final bit. This is the really key thing is if you can, you can do VTI assessment, you can do an, uh, an intervention and look before and after and see changes. OK, um, I've shown you this. I'm actually I'm just going to skip through this because uh, I'm, I don't want to waste your time. Um, but there, this is another um, uh, this is another um, thing to look at on the uh, the critical care website, critical care in Northampton. Uh, it's just an infographic. And I just want to finalise with this slide. You know, um, this is my approach and how I integrate ultrasound into my clinical practice. I assess people clinically. I work out whether I think there's hypovolemia or preload problems because of other things. I, I have a, a, an understanding of where I think the patient might be and what I want to do to them. I use uh, focus ultrasound to assess their tolerance. You've seen all of those low tolerance states already. I then look at their LVOT VTI as a baseline. If I if, if it's the only piece of kit I've got near me, obviously in the ICU we might have other things to do this. Then I do something and it's probably at first a fear challenge, but uh, at some point we move on to giving vasopressors and then iron shapes. And I want to be sure, am I doing some good? And I want to see responsiveness and I mean this you know ventricular responsiveness increase in stroke volume with the intervention to show that I've done the right thing at least in the short term okay so um, that's how I start to bring all this stuff into hemodynamics there's a whole lot more stuff in hemodynamics than just the left heart and forward flow and there's a huge amount of interest now in the right heart venous congestion etc this is taking your ultrasound uh, journey you know probably to more advanced levels um, but I think it's certainly coming into kind of mainstream conversations and, um, you know, it, it's certainly uh, it's a growth area and something to keep your eye on. This is my last slide. just want to just make a few acknowledgements. Um, if you're interested in taking heart ultrasound further, please have a look at Fusic Heart. It's, um, it, it's definitely uh, a more of a commitment. It's something that you could do um, inside your training when you have the time and ability to do that. Um, you'll probably have people in your hospital that can help to mentor you. Please reach out to them because we, we'd love to help uh, train you. We don't matter what specialty uh, trainees come from. We just want to want to get on and teach it. So that's the first thing. Please scan this for your final QR for the day. This is uh, Quick Care Northampton. Lots of cool infographics from my great friends Johnny and Ashley and I. This is my Twitter handle. These are um, Ashley and Johnny's. So you've probably got those already. Um, but look, it's really great to talk to you today. I'm, I'm sorry I can't see you. Um, I hope you've heard all of that. And uh, yeah, I hope I'll, I'll look forward to answering any questions if you've got time and energy to ask them. So thanks very much. Uh, Marcus, uh, uh, just to let you know, there were about 29 participants listening in. I know you can't see it, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know whether you can switch off your screen share and then uh, sh show yourself. But I have a question for you from Jack Eldridge. Uh, so he asked about the minute distance, that new concept you mentioned about, yeah, yeah. and he asked whether you've used it in your practice, and if so, what are the rough numbers you would use to define a low cardiac output state? So that's a really good question. I'd have to do the maths. I mean, it's not something that I do much of because I tend to to look at stroke volume and VTI in the short term, but I think it's a really good point, good question. Um, it's something that might be useful um, uh, down the line as a research tool because I think um, it, it, it avoids the measurement of LVOT diameter, which is difficult. So it's, it's a kind of construct as much as anything else at this point, but I thought you might be interested because you guys are sponges of all this stuff. I'm sorry I don't have the, the perfect answer for that. No, that's fantastic. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? I think uh, lots of people were really appreciative. I thought it was a great talk. I, I'm, I'm not sure whether you can see the chat, uh, Marcus, but uh, they're all really appreciative. Oh, that's great. Great. Right. Uh, just open it for five more minutes for any questions. Uh, if not, then uh, we'll we'll end the we'll end the session. Martha, thank you so much. That was a really fantastic talk. You're such a good educator, and you're really good at it even online. That's amazing. Thank oh, you. That's kind of you. That's a lovely thing to say. Thank you. you made my day. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent.